This is The Premise, and I'm your host, Chad Thompson. Chad Thompson's the host. I'm the host. (laughs) I'm Jennifer Thompson. And I'm Chad Thompson, the host. (laughs) So... Here on The Premise, we talk to, in this case, the man behind the story. Today we're talking to Gil Sodu, a slinger of words, a poet, spoken word master, a playwright, an author, a father, a DJ, an entertainer, a man of God, a man of humanity and soul. (laughs) And we're here to uncover his story, to his inspiration, his joy, his premise. So hello, Gil. Hey, how you doing? Welcome. That was a great intro. Wow, yeah. Yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, Yeah, well, I appreciate you being here. Yeah, thank you. And so yeah, poetry, spoken word. Mm -hmm. You are a DJ. You wrote an opera. Yeah, a spoken word opera, yeah. Yeah. where it's where we we added elements of poetry, but uh, also added the operatic voice to help with the storytelling, as long along with like soul music, um, a little bit of hip hop, not too much, um, and kind of mashed it all together. Um, and uh, I I got the blessing with the San Diego Opera. I, I learned a lot from them um, on on what it really means because I had never really even been to an opera before. All right, yeah. Um, until, and then I, uh, someone introduced me to the administrative staff of the San Diego opera and then they started inviting me to more operas and, and I got a, a sense before I started writing it, what a, an opera was and what it entailed. And I got it from like in advice from the experts and then I just, just did it. That's awesome. Yeah. Did you decide you were going to do an opera and then all this started to happen yeah yeah i had always i just thought the the the, like those words together sounded cool they do sound cool spoken word (laughs) opera and i had never heard of anyone trying it i always like to try to push myself artistically cool um trying things out that have either never been done or at least i've never done it right so uh i thought of that and then someone introduced me to the uh, san diego opera and then from that they asked me to help them with some of their educational stuff, um, like going into high schools or bringing the high schools to their like scenic shop and, and performing for the, the kids there and helping them with their performances and um, serving on a couple of, of panels that they had. So I, I started to develop this relationship with the opera as well. And then after all of that, then I, I, I wrote it. Yeah. That's pretty incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been, very cool. I've been very blessed. You're also, you, you also perform with the San Diego Symphony. Yeah, I've performed with the San Diego Symphony. Um, I did it, the main, I performed on the San Diego Symphony stage a few times for different reasons. One was to open for a rapper, uh, Talib Kweli. Yeah, he's a pretty yeah, famous awesome. rapper, yeah. Um, and then another, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, another time was uh, we did uh, a, like I had told, I had already had a, a relationship with them from that. And then also I hosted an event in the opera lobby that, that they had. Um, it was kind of like they wanted to hear the voices of San Diego and they brought it all, all together, like different types of um, just forms of musical expression. Mm-hmm. And I hosted that show with them. So I, I had this relationship with them. And then um, I was talking to the the administrative people there and I said, you know what? Uh, my dream has always been to perform on that Embarcadero stage out nice. in uh, Seaport Village. Yeah. And in fact, like maybe like a few months before that, I had I was sitting with a friend and I told her we, we had tried to come to a show um, uh, and we got there too late to get inside. So, you know, have you ever been around there? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. even from the rocks outside, you can hear it like crystal clear. Um, and we were sitting outside and I was like, one day I'm going to make it on that stage. One day nice. I'm going to be on that stage. And then a few months later, I, I told her that, uh, told the person at the, at the opera, I'm sorry, at the symphony, that story. And then I, I she's like, all right, let's make it happen. Let's make it happen. Yeah. That's cool. So, so they, they have, uh, every time they have the summer pop series, they have one day as a community, uh, day that they invite people to come for free and they, they host, um, people from the community, like nice. artists from the community. Yeah. This time, they let me produce the whole show and, wow. and get all of uh, my super friends mm-hmm. and 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 get the band and everything. Uh, and so we performed on that stage, and it was amazing. 
Uh, so that was that time. But the time I, I performed, you know, I feel like I'm uh, <laughs> giving long, long. No, it's good. No, keep going. For simple keep questions. Going. Uh, yes, I performed the symphony. <laughs> I should have stopped right oh. there. Hell no, no, keep <laughs> but, going. Uh, uh, the the last time was um, they had a program with elementary school kids and they they bust in like maybe two thousand plus elementary school uh, kids and I worked with a uh, the um, uh, conductor and and some other people there and that one that time it was just me backed by the entire symphony and what I was doing is poetically introducing the pieces that they were going to do some modern some classic and and um l- like informing the kids what they should be listening for what the what the music is saying mm-hmm. like uh mm-hmm. w- maybe what the composer was thinking or what it was trying to do and trying to you know just give them access to it and, and instead of just them playing the the song yeah right um so i would do that before each each piece and that that's was cool. a lot of fun we did like maybe five six shows of that that's awesome yeah yeah what a great experience yeah it was really great it was just cool to get that picture of just me, this little dot uh, right. amongst this huge uh, symphony orchestra. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And for the kids, too. What an incredible experience. Yeah. I, I actually I was dr- walking back to my car afterwards because um, they paid me for my time, but not for my parking. And I was walking uh, 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 a little ways of mine and then a group of kids had saw me and they were like, oh, my God, you were just on the stage. Oh, that was great. And then they they want to take pictures with me and, wow. and all this stuff and yeah it was cool it was cool you get to be an inspiration yeah and the, be inspired i would imagine yeah it, it was really great to um i didn't get to to chance to interact with the kids as much because once because you know it was during school hours for a lot of the shows so they mm-hmm. had to get bussed right away right but for the ones that i was able to to interact with it was really great yeah and you do a lot of work with kids. Yeah, I try not to, even though I have two young kids, that's enough for me. I try not to do <laughs> a lot with like elementary. I prefer mm-hmm. high school, junior high at the most. Mm-hmm. Um, Why? But because of the, because I tend to, I write things that I need to hear. Mm-hmm. I write things that are mainly for adults, even though not. Uh, uh, everything I have which you consider like adult content meaning like I'm not cursing a lot or being very vulgar in my pe- my piece because that's not just not what I'm about right um, uh, but I don't have any I don't have a lot of work that's particularly geared towards kids right if I do have to work with kids it's more uh, and this is like elementary or it's more with like just helping them with their performance or helping them with their um their stage presence or or something like that or with their their writing um i don't really like performing for them because you have to one takes up a lot of energy and and most most performers that i know that have worked with small kids they'll tell you the same thing like you could do the same poem for adults that you do for kids and kid by the time the kids are done you're like wiped out because you (laughs) just gotta really like hey guys and da 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 um so it takes up a lot of energy Mm mm-hmm and um like you don't know how much they they're getting sometimes they're really perceptive and they really latch on to certain things uh which is great and other times they're just like you know like right, right. just ready for recess totally different experience. yeah it that different, makes sense yeah so a lot of teachers i've i've turned down like principals and 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 people that have asked me to come perform because they've seen me perform somewhere else right and they consider that oh this would be great for my kids to hear because I think they just want to see they want their kids to see someone like passionate about what they're doing and mm-hmm. performing and doing their thing. But for me, um, I always have this feeling like they can take it or leave it. The only reason why they really love it is that they're taking a break from their normal school day. Sure. And, yeah. and so someone's up there doing their thing. Um, and that's kind of what they get out of it. So it's not till they're older and they, they have to deal with a lot more I- I issues mm-hmm. in, internally that I think they really get it and they can really um, like, uh, just latch on to what I'm talking about. Well, you you really talk about some some hardline issues in your mm-hmm. work. I mean, you talk about toxic masculinity. Mm-hmm. You talk a lot about being a black man in America. Mm-hmm. And you're growing up with 
so many things and so many pressures. And you just said earlier that you write what you need to hear. Yeah. And that was going to be one of my questions is, you know, it feels like you're writing for yourself. I mean, in, in one piece, you were saying, I haven't figured it out. Yeah. It's that vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what makes it so magical. It's like, mm -hmm. wow, he's being so honest and it's so real and people can relate to that. Mm -hmm. Did, is that something that you've done on purpose or has just happened? I do. Uh, I do it on purpose, especially uh, as I got uh, to be a more mature writer. Um, I write for myself things that I like I need to hear in like that I would want to hear. Mm -hmm. But I'm also considering the audience. So what I feel like a lot of first time writers, let's just take it to like poetry. What a lot of first time writers they'll do is they, they write for themselves, but then they, they put a lot of, of metaphors or, or even like pop culture references that only they would know, or maybe their immediate friends, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so it goes over the, uh, um, the standard audience. Like I consider like, I'm going to be performing it for high schoolers. And then maybe the next day I'm gonna be doing it in like, uh, for people who are in their sixties you know mm -hmm. so i have to if i do put pop culture references or or something like that i i try to limit it or make it some things like so big so like i can mention michael jackson but i probably wouldn't uh mention the weekend mm -hmm. you see what i'm saying yeah so everybody knows michael jackson not everybody knows the weekend even though he's like popular now what i could do what i uh, and often do is i'll change it for the room you know, like, so I know if I have that pop culture reference in that moment, You'll then, change it and then I could change it right there. And I always try to add elements of the room that I'm in to make it more intimate, mm -hmm. like re refer to someone uh, with a South Park shirt or, um, you know, refer to the, the cat that is ignoring me in the room or something <laughs> like that. I, like I'll do those things to make it more intimate. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I always considered it like poems like songs so if it's a really good poem people are going to ask you to repeat it over over again or you're going to want to repeat it because you know that the audience is going to enjoy it so if you think about like how many times prince had to sing purple rain he better like that song right you see what i'm saying sure so and i i tell artists that especially poets you know you got to really like what you what you're what you're performing because if it's good then it's going to be in your canon mm -hmm. and and you're going to have to perform it over and over again um if you want because a lot of times you when you come in you only got 10 15 minutes to make an impression and you never know who's going to be in the room and and a lot and uh, another thing that uh early poets like to do is oh i just did this poem the other day at this venue i want to do something new here and that could be good but your your newest stuff is never going to be as powerful as your seasoned stuff mm -hmm. you know so do the if you only and this is the first time this audience is seeing you you better do the things that you know you can perform it powerfully and lose yourself in that performance right yeah more so than worrying about like did I say the word right or, or, or often when we're reading stuff, we fix things on the fly in our either in our head or uh, as we're reading it. Have you ever done that? You Absolutely. read something to someone and you, you fix it on the fly. So it's better to do things that, that you already kind of know where you're going and what you're doing. And then you could play around with it and be p more playful with your performance. Yeah. It's totally like it, it's got some improv. Well, and people are there to hear your greatest hits, not, not, not the new album. Right, right, right. Exactly. You can, you can throw in like one or two of them in a set, <laughs> but you, you, you better play the, the ones that, and even for people who've never heard you, it, you're just going to be, you're just going to come across as a, a more professional and seasoned artist that way. And again, I've performed like in very small rooms, but there was someone in that room that has given me opportunities that has changed my life, mm. you know, cause you just never know. Yeah. You know, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. We never know. Mm -hmm. You wrote a comic book too. Yeah. <laughs> 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 You're pretty good. Um, yes. It's a sore spot for me because, um, should I say this? All right. I'm just gonna say, it. uh, so I, I wrote a comic book. I was very excited about it. Um, we were going to do a Kickstarter for it. And we even filmed a video for it. And I ended up not putting out the Kickstarter because like there's something there's something old school in me that doesn't like to do Kickstarters uh, and uh, go fund me because like I, um, I feel like 
I'm getting a little bit over it now. I still haven't done a Kickstarter, but like, feels like you're like begging for money, begging for you know? Money, yeah. And I, I just, it just wasn't me at the time. So I funded it myself, right? So wrote the whole thing and I paid an artist to create, I um, mean, to, to draw illustrate and paint, it. illustrate yeah. it, do the lettering. Cause usually in comic books, uh, someone does the lettering, someone does the coloring, someone does the, the, the pencils. Uh, but if you have find someone really talented, they could do all of it. Mm. And that was like, shoot, like three years ago. And I still haven't gotten it back. Oh, really? But yeah. And I paid him a grip of money. Uh, uh, and, and so he's, he, you know, f- I kept on emailing him, texting him, uh, all the different things. He finally got back to me maybe a couple months ago. I, I like I, I was at the point. This is after like two, three years bef- after he said that he would deliver the stuff. Right. And uh, and I finally said, you know, I, I don't want to. Ha- you can just forget about the comic and just give me my money back mm-hmm. or part of my money back or something like I don't want to take it any further, but I will if I have to. And he's like. He finally wrote me back and he's like, my bad. I thought I had gotten it to you. Um, wow. <laughs> and, 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 he, and then he's like, you know, I've gone through hard times and he just listed all the hard times he went through. And then he said, um, I'm, I'm out of California now and um, I'm going to come back in two weeks. And then uh, it's in my storage and I'll get it to you right away. And then so I waited to month later no and he emailed him back hey what's up and he's like oh he gave me another excuse and he's like uh even if i have to do the whole thing over then i'm gonna do it Mm. and then so we'll see what happens yeah and that was like maybe like four months ago yeah uh so still nothing i just wanted i'm sorry to bring up a source no 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 no, it's okay here's (laughs) the thing here's the thing is that um I wanted it because, like, I want to eventually write more and more comics. I wanted it as not as like I'm going to make a lot of money off this, but like I feel like any kind of creator wants to see that you're going to willing to put in the work mm-hmm. um, and have that my the whole comic book as like, almost like a calling card or a business card to sure. say this is what I can do. Right. You know, uh, instead of a lot of people, they come and they they say like I have an idea for this, I have an idea for that. Tons of people have ideas, but let me see you execute. Sure, you know, and so that was my we know that yeah exactly. <laughs> so that was my way of executing, um, but it hasn't been executed. Man, you should have stayed around for the festival Mm. because there there was a panel at the end after you left Mm -hmm. and they had a a comic book writer like he actually has a comic book keithan jones do you know keithan oh you gotta meet keithan he's super cool well yeah is that who you're talking about yeah yeah well, we, we discussed that. I, I had to work. Uh, it wasn't getting Yeah, paid. I know. Yeah. I, know, I, know. <laughs> I, did the, I did the festival but, for free. Yeah, but. I mean, are we going to bring him back That's next year? That's a good year? point. Are we, yeah. yeah. Are we going to bring back Gil next year? No, oh, I'm oh, He's introducing our keynote. Yeah. Well, we should just tell our listeners. So we're talking about the San Diego Writers Festival. Mm-hmm. And I found you because someone had told me how amazing you are. And I looked you up and I was mm-hmm. like, yeah, this guy's great. Mm-hmm. And I reached out to you. I think it was on Facebook. So your website's mm-hmm. working for you. Yeah. yeah and I said, it. hey, you know, we really want you to come and do a small piece and of mm. course we had no budget we mm-hmm. still don't yeah we're working on that right and uh you introduced our keynote speaker who was piper kerman right. author of orange is the new black it was incredible yeah and I, the room i mean you did you got two standing ovations yeah people loved it and i think it was like the biggest highlight was gil sodu uh, so this year you've graciously no offense piper if no you're listening offense, piper. no piper was great <laughs> she was great too i, I you had w- energy you had magic uh, there's magic in the room i appreciate it and and i was just honored that that she enjoyed it you know mm-hmm, she really did um, yeah she was kind of blown away uh, i think she was like oh wow <laughs> Yeah, now, this is real. Yeah, for the next guy, the the you know the walking Scott Gimple. Scott yeah. Gimple, yeah. Um, it, it was easier to talk about like the work that I do is easier to talk about like prison reform or, or to, to add little like segues in between that can match up right. with that. Now you got to do it about zombies. Exactly. <laughs> you can do this. Although yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I love the walking dead and, and I just watched zombie land part two. Oh, um, but I can't wait to see that. Yeah. Actually. <laughs> but uh, like, I'm, 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 I've been actually thinking about like, what can I do to, to match it up? Cause I, I don't want it to be like completely random, uh, you know, this poet coming before him and, and why, but you know, I have some ideas. 
Well, and you know, I was really impressed. You know, I didn't expect you to tie it in, honestly. Mm. I expect you to just give an awesome performance mm-hmm. and the room is going to love it. But that's not what happened. Mm. You really did speak to the room about what was going to happen and the experience they were about to have. It's like you were warming up the audience. Yeah. To, and I think that they enjoyed Piper that much more because mm-hmm. of it. Yeah. You know, it was just, there was so much energy. And as you were like building and like at one point, I think everyone forgot where they were Mm. and what was happening because we were all in that, that space that you had created. And that's that magic. Yeah. That was really cool. I really appreciate that. I, um, you'll hear the word zombie come out of my mouth during the performance. Awesome. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. I I can already (laughs) almost guarantee it. Well, I mean, Coronado is going to be taken by storm. So, you Mm. know, we moved the festival to Coronado. Oh, yeah. No, I didn't know. Yeah, yeah. So they basically courted us and said, Mm. you know, we really want to be part of this. Yeah, Marnie did tell me that. That's right. And, you know, and San Diego Public Library was fabulous. It was a wonderful experience, a great Mm -hmm. venue. But we already maxed out what we could do there, Mm. which we weren't really. one year. (laughs) Yeah, in our inaugural year, we weren't expecting that. We had probably 1,500 people. Mm -hmm. And Coronado just has so much more space. Is it the library? Is it the? It's the Coronado Public Library. They have the Spreckles Performing Arts Center right Mm. there. It's also on the campus of the Coronado High School, and they have a gorgeous performing arts center. So we have several spaces to fill, you know, 650 people Mm. instead of 250. Mm. So we have a lot of room to grow and a lot more space. There's free parking. We're working on getting a free shuttle. My, my one major concern and the thing that's really important to me is the feeling of it being inclusive, Mm -hmm. you know, and having people come from all communities come and feel welcome. Mm -hmm. So we're working on a shuttle from downtown. We're working on a free ferry and, you know, Mm -hmm. just get people over there. It's not an Island people. There are Mm -hmm. two inroads to Coronado. Mm -hmm. It's a peninsula. It's a peninsula. Mm -hmm. But you know, if they want to call it the Island, that's cool too. (laughs) But you know, I think it's going to be, it's going to be a good space. It has more room for growth and that's what we're doing. Cool, cool. Yeah, I mean, I've I've told people I wanted to be, you know, as big as Comic Con, mm. and and I see absolutely no reason why we can't make that happen. You yeah. know, the Writers Festival, where people come from all over, but but this isn't about the Writers Festival. It's about okay. you. All right. So <laughs> I'm going to get back to you know, you're a bit of a Renaissance man. Mm. Um, I'm curious how your f- friends introduce you. They must have to keep note cards to, to figure <laughs> out. Like, <laughs> uh, that's funny. Um. <laughs> so, is, are there any? labels that people have used to introduce you that has surprised you um hmm. that's a good question that has surprised me Hmm. no uh back when i first started poetry um they used to it it used to bother me that like sometimes they would call me like uh i would be doing poetry just like anybody else this is even before i got heavy into spoken word mm-hmm. which is more performance based I, I was just mainly reading they would they would call me rapper gill um oh, interesting. It, it, and like it, it was like a double-edged sword because like i i did enjoy to enjoy like hip-hop i'm a hip-hop head and i rap occasionally in like 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 to the side but i was doing the same type of my poems weren't rhyming right and and this is when i was living in ventura um which is kind of lily white um and kind of kind of um it's like it's it, literally the home of patagonia yeah 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 <laughs> but yeah exactly couldn't so, go and get more white <laughs> so, so uh we had uh ventura and then oxnard which is mixed you grew up in oxnard yeah i grew you? up in oxnard which is mixed and we had migrant workers and we had it was very very mixed and then um and then Camarillo was on the other side of us, which is also like retired uh, mm-hmm. white cats. And so, um, yeah, they used to introduce me as, as rapper Gil and and like uh, that kind of bothered me um, sometimes when they but would. But it was get, incorrect. Yeah, it was incorrect. That's yeah. why it bothered you. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You, so you're saying you can't freestyle? Yeah, I can freestyle <laughs> a little bit. I mean, don't test me now. But <laughs> or or a oh, lot of times I they beat. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of times on write ups, uh, it would include uh, like it would be everybody's name, and then it would be like Black Poet Gill. Like it would like those little little yeah. microaggressions that people didn't know. And and here's the thing: like they all had. It was all coming from a good place. They just didn't realize it. They were just like 
like older and and like didn't really couldn't really distinguish the like someone young and black uh from he must be a rapper. rapper. He must be a rapper or yeah. or let me describe him a little bit right. or something like that. And I just wanted to be like on the same level totally. as, as everybody else. So those are the kind of things that would bother me um, as far as introducing me of something surprising. Um, no, not 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 too much. They just they'll say Jill. And they'll say Soto, that I get that a lot, or they'll, uh, that's it, just incorrect things, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, so back in, you were inter- interviewed by the reader, I, I forget how long ago it was, mm-hmm. but your name was S. O. Mm-hmm. T. And I was like, what was that about? Like, you turned your, na- your last name into a, uh, an acronym. Acro- acronym. So, Gil Soto is not my legal name. Okay, I figured uh, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when I first started performing, um, uh, I, my last name is Gil and Water. And so Gil is short for Gil and Water. I was in the Navy, so everybody called each other by their last name. So instead of saying Gil and Water, they would just call me Gil. Gotcha. You know, uh, in my when my dad was in the Navy, they used to call him Big Gil. Mm. Um, and then so... Uh, I first started performing, I was doing like a mashup of like music and poetry and hip hop and everything um, and singing. And so I I started playing with a small band and I wanted to uh, call it like Gil and the somethings or whatever. Um, So I decided one day, I don't know how I came up with it, but like I decided for the last part to be SOTU soundtrack of the unheard. Uh Uh, And I did it as a way of reminding myself that uh, I wanted my work to be for the people who felt like they didn't have a voice. Yeah. You know, like it wasn't about me. And even to this day, my mantra before I get on any stage, no matter how small or how big I, I, I touch my chest and I say, um, let me touch at least one person in the crowd. Cause I try to take the focus off of me. So I don't need to be the dopest person in the room. Mm -hmm. I just need to be like passionate about what I'm saying so that I can reach one person. And then what inevitably happens, I reach several people. Uh, but I always make Make it like I, I want to say something that someone else needs to hear at this moment, you know. Mm. Um, so it was like soundtrack of the unheard, right? And then, um, so that encompassed anybody, and that was the thing. It was like I had uh, uh, not dependable bandmates, and I knew that they are going to be changing in and out, you know. Right. So you know <laughs> no how it is, right? There, I right. Suppose. So that's why I like I was like whoever I play with, it's still this is. So to this is the so to part. Nice. This is the soundtrack. I'm Gil. This is the soundtrack. We're together as a soundtrack. And then later on, as I started doing more and more solo stuff, I was someone had suggested it, and I decided to do it anyway. Like, let me just take out the dot. Take out the dots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, 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 even though I'm a poet, I don't like repeating myself a bunch of times and that's something you got to explain a lot of exactly that. that makes sense and then people start getting cute and calling me by my government name and like it, I, even though i want them to call me gill and so i just took it out and now it's just gill so too and it's I did, easy peasy yeah and i did the doing business as gill so too and, mm-hmm. and everything like even I, I work at the old globe and my name badge and my id card says gill so too i just keep it like that across the board cool yeah. cool well, thanks for sharing. Yeah, yeah, no problem. I'm not, I'm not embarrassed by my name, but it's just no, no, it's cool. Yeah, um, but yeah, when you're, you know, you, that's your stage name, and you want yeah. to be, you, you want people to respect that. Exactly. One of the lines in in one of your songs, I'm willing to get my black belt in uncool around you. <laughs> We're going back a little ways. Wow, you do good research. So my my question is, do you have a black belt? <laughs> <laughs> I was I, I took for many years kung fu. You uh, did. I did not get my black belt. Um, uh, I the teacher went away for some. I don't know what happened. But anyway, uh, no, I didn't. But I was. I'm always. I'm always a. You know, it's funny. That's such an old poem, mm. and I'm about to perform that tonight in front really? of the class. Oh yeah, wow, which is interesting. But because um, they want to. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, so so there's a reason for that. There's yeah. a reason you're performing it. Yeah, and 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 um, I've always just been like a huge fan of kung fu. Hmm. I think African Americans in general. I mean, that's where we get the Wu Tang Clan Wu-Tang. from. Yeah. Are you watching that doc- <laughs> that, that series? Absolutely. Yeah. It's really good. We're big fans. We love the Wu Tang. Oh, do you really? Oh, we cool. also love kung fu. Oh, do you? Yeah. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Um, yeah, grew up on it, loved it. So, yeah. 
We've only seen one one episode of Wu Ting. We haven't had a chance to see the rest, but it's we're really excited. good. It's, it's, I was impressed. Yeah, just the first one. Yeah. It's done really well. Riz's uh, uh, and and some other people uh, wrote it, and um, they they get really creative with it, like how they're telling the story. It's mm-hmm. it's not just a straight narrative. Sometimes they go into animation. Sometimes they go, um, you know, just different things. Yeah, which yeah. I'm digging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's one of the things that I think is so cool about you is you're willing to go into these different, you know, genres Mm -hmm. and, you know, your art kind of bleeds into so many different areas. And, you know, I have Mm -hmm. a lot of respect for that because that's got to make it, it's really exciting for you, but Mm -hmm. is it harder to make it in a world where people are like, well, what's happening now? Uh, financially yeah because yeah. it seems like you're trying you're building an audience with this one thing and then you yeah. go and do opera yeah and people yeah. are like what the <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> are um, they willing to come along with you yeah that's the question that's a great question if okay so it's two things it it it, it can probably does hurt my pocket like if i was just going straight into poetry and did like just nothing but slams and tried to to do um nothing but poetry um, I probably, uh, do okay. Uh, I, well, I'm feel like I'm doing okay now. I, I feel like I maybe do better. Um, however, I'm the type of person who gets excited by new challenges, right? Yeah. like more so than money. Mm-hmm. So like, I'm about to do this performance, uh, a play I wrote a 15 minute play with blind spot collective, um, where I'm performing, uh, at the airport, San Diego airport. Cool. Yeah. Past security. At Terminal the, two. Yeah. In the food oh, court yeah. and everything like that, where they have the stage of the yeah. piano and stuff. Yeah. Um, now, recently i've i've done like my poetry performances I, I've, I've i still do a lot and then any of the plays i tend to not put myself in it because mm. it's just a lot of rehearsals You've done you a lot of plays. In. yeah it's just been a lot of rehearsals and a lot of things so like i try to like let the young actors you know who have the time and the energy and not two kids and a wife uh deal with that <laughs> stuff and i i'll just come to one a few of the performances and, and clap them on but this one i've never performed at the airport and and I wanted to try it. So I was just at rehearsals right before this. Um, and that's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the only reason. And it's not definitely not the money. Uh, uh, <laughs> that's the only reason why I'm doing this particular one is because um, I wanted to perform at the, the that that venue. So I think that if I only stuck to the one thing, mm-hmm. it, it would be it, it, like I feel like I wouldn't be one. I wouldn't be as excited. Uh, because again, I go back to I have to do the same type of stuff over and over again, and two, it wouldn't it wouldn't feed my soul. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, like I, I need to express myself in different ways. Like before I even started writing, um, f- from uh, the age of like four till I was twenty one, I thought I was going to be a, a, a illustrator. Really? Yeah, I thought I was going to be like either comic book writer or graphic designer or something. Uh, uh, sorry, comic book illustrator or, or graphic designer or something like that. I was always just drawing. That's it. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I mean, that's been one of my burning questions, but the most cliche of them all is like, you know, what got you started into spoken word? And you play guitar, don't you? Piano. Oh, you play piano. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like at some point, like your instrument stopped coming out of your fingers and it started coming out of your mouth. Yeah. Well, it came out of my mouth first and then my fingers. Uh, well, okay. first, first fingers with the drawing, then the mouth and then the fingers with the piano. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. What was your question? No, no. I was just like, at what point did like the, 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 the passion for spoken word, you know, take over, mm. you know, those other passions, like clearly you're a creative and you, mm-hmm. you're, I can only guess that your mom, must have inspired that in you or encouraged that in you and yeah um she she was happy as long as i wasn't getting in trouble totally um when uh when i was younger she was always encouraging me to draw more and and getting me stuff for doing that and i was a ferocious reader as well um and i used to write even back then but i would only show like one other person Mm -hmm. um my short stories and everything it wasn't until i got in the navy and i had a lot of time and water in front of me (laughs) that i would really start writing more and more more songs more um more poetry and then i started in uh kind of impromptu 
open mic on the ship, like in the kit, in the in the in the galley, in the where we're eating, uh, get guys together, and they would just share their work. I had never even really heard of an open mic before, wow. and I, we didn't call it that. Yeah, and it wasn't until I got out of the navy, I went to my first open mic, and I was like, oh, that's what I was doing back then. That's cool, you know. And to this day, I'm still bringing people together to to express themselves creatively. It's just something that's inherent within me. This is who you are. Yeah, I have to do it. Yeah, like even though it's a lot of work and it's mostly thankless and but like i just there's something in me like i have to do it do you find that it's harder to find the time to do that like you used to have an open mic at mm -hmm. queen b it's scary how much you know about me I just sort of, i've like, been man, stuck yeah. in you yeah, it just holds everything <laughs> yeah but go ahead i'm sorry i'm sorry no no so you used to do that yeah pretty, i did pretty it for, awesome like, for event. five years train of thought the the proudest thing that i'm um proud thing that i'm pr most proud about that is that we had like several marriages come out of that really yeah yeah speaking of that like, like literal to, marriages or yeah marriage, yeah created marriages be, both 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 mm -hmm. well uh, uh, speaking of that i'd like to mm -hmm. quote you on something it says but you know what i'm most proud of Renee and I made it two years. Now, this was in an interview you gave several years ago. Okay. And we are still happy. <laughs> and I still like her around. Yeah. And she still makes me laugh and annoys me and surprises mm. me, bruises my pride and motivates me. I've done all right by myself. Not rich or famous by a long shot, but most days I wake up with a smile, can't ask for much more. So there's two questions here. Mm -hmm. Number one, you seem surprised that your, your marriage made it you know, and now you've been married six years, but you know, at that point, eight, eight years. Yeah, eight. You yeah. were married in two thir 2013? No, I was married 2011. 2011. All right. So, maybe, so by that, by what I said, we've been together two years, we've been married for two years. Gotcha. Uh, yeah. Gotcha. So you seem surprised that you made it two years. Well, I was married before. Okay. Yeah. 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 The onion unfolds. Here it's rolling. <laughs> Give us the onion. Um, the layers are here. Yeah. And, and surprisingly, that young lady um, didn't really want me to be an artist. Interesting. She didn't really express that outwardly, but like through her actions. And sometimes she would tell me she wanted me to be more of a just an average like business person um, because I was always good with people. So like that's what she saw and 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 she wanted me to do more than that than more so than like being out at night performing and everything like that. Right, right. Uh, cuz she didn't really care that much about going to the shows or anything like um so I just felt myself slipping away from myself. Yeah. And and so our our marriage ended uh with it had nothing to do with anybody else or anything. I just I just um knew that I wasn't feeling like me anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I had to get it, uh, like end it. And then, so with, with Renee, I, I, that was one of the first things I said, like, I am an artist. This is me. This is yeah. me. And she's, she was all for it. Nice. She was all for it. And sometimes it's still hard, you know, um, like there was a moment when I had a residency for two years at the Jacob, Jacob Center, Center yeah. and um, that was ending. And so I had to look for another job. And um, I had recently just watched a, a Facebook clip or something of Steve Harvey. Hmm. And he's talking about making the leap. Yeah. And you, you have to, have you seen that one? Yep, totally. And, and you have to make that leap at some time. And it just kind of sparked a fire in me. And I was like, you know what? The evidence, because while I was working at the Jacob Center, I was still doing lots of gigs like outside of that, right? And I was like, the evidence is showing that, that, uh, people will pay me for my work and that they enjoy my work and that I can keep this steady. And so I'm just going to take the leap. And I told Renee that and this is as I was sending in resumes and uh, she locked herself in the bathroom <laughs> and cried for a while oh. uh, because we had just <laughs> had, a, we had just, just had, had a, kid, a baby yeah. Yeah, and everything. And like, uh, so uh, then she came out maybe like an hour later, give her her space. And she's like, okay, if we have to, you know, get and move into a trailer or move to Mexico. Let's 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 try to do it. And now I support my wow. two kids just doing nothing but art. She used to work for the San Diego Health Center. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Does she still work there? No, she she. Uh, uh, I did some research on <laughs> Renee, too. 
And <laughs> this she, is just crazy. She, you're so well prepared. I'm so impressed. I've been told that she's an amazing, selfless, really organized individual. Yeah. And I, so I'm not surprised that you chose her as your life partner. Yeah, she's really good at all the things that I am not and vice versa, <laughs> um, which can we know cause, something about that. Yeah, which can cause friction. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. But when you look at the bigger picture, you're like, oh, thank God. What happened was like uh, when we first started dating, I had confessed to her one day, like I wrote down all these things because I had been married before and she had, was got out of a long term relationship, wrote down all the things that I wanted in a, in a partner. Mm-hmm. And she hit like 85, 90 percent of it. And then I did the same for her. And it was weird because like <laughs> we just went to a, a marriage retreat and um uh just to, uh, and like one of the questions it was like how did you feel or what did you think when you first saw your your spouse like just in general and then she put that uh he annoyed me <laughs> because um i was uh she was a friend of a friend and i was like djing the party and then like afterwards I, I, you know, after I cleaned up all my equipment, I would stick around and like talk to her and she was just trying. Now I know that when Renee's ready to go to bed, she's ready to go to bed. <laughs> uh, I was trying to stick around. I was thinking we were having a good conversation. She was being polite. Like, when is this dude going to go home? <laughs> but I guess I wore her down, you know, like a good poet. Sometimes that's what you got to do. Sometimes that's what you got to do. Romance is work uh, sometimes. Uh-huh. I had to sand it down <laughs> and make it smooth. You know, I I was going to ask you how you balance. I mean, you've got two children. Mm -hmm. You're involved in so many things. Mm -hmm. You work in the juvenile detention center, Mm -hmm. which is a a pretty amazing experience. And I have a question about that. But how do you balance, you know, your your marriage, the romance, keeping the romance alive after Mm -hmm. eight years, Mm -hmm. raising two children and, and giving so much back to the community and like still being able to be creative? It's very difficult mm-hmm. and a um, lot of, uh, of of little bit of sleep. Like, <laughs> So you gave up on sleep. That was yeah, the thing yeah. you had to cut. Like, for example, I could just give you this weekend. This weekend, I, um, I, I stopped working at the juvenile detention center a few years ago. I work at the actually uh, a full penitentiary. No, you do? Yeah, Sentinella okay. State Pen, um, and it's maximum security. I go there every Friday uh, on behalf of the Old Globe. We teach Shakespeare. Awesome. In creative writing. And so um, I go there uh, f- like Friday morning, like at six, uh, started at 630. And we drive an hour and a half. We stay there for three hours, drive an hour and a half back. Um, as soon as I was done, um, then I, I DJed a show at uh, Balboa Park for uh, poets and writers, mm-hmm. no artists and, and writers, arts and artists and poets. There's a series that Michael Clam, I don't know if you know him. Uh, he does down at the Museum of Living Artists in Balboa Park across from uh, the, the Old Globe. So I DJed that till like 10 o'clock. Uh, the next morning, I gave a DJ lesson. Then I, I had a wedding to, to to DJ later on. Wow. The next morning, I... I uh, this is a weekend. Yeah. Not a month. Yeah. And this is not <laughs> this is not new. Uh, <laughs> this is not something that's out of the ordinary. The next morning, I work for my church as the artist in residence there. So I have to be there early. And I usually have to DJ a wedding late at night mm. on Saturday night, yeah. uh, almost every Saturday, and then wake up early to go there. Then I hosted a panel for artists uh, after that. And then I had like a, a four or five hour rehearsal for this airport gig. And then I'm, I'm back at it again this morning. So, wow. Uh, it's, I it's feel tired just listening. To it. <laughs> it's a lot. So, uh, so how do I, uh, how do I balance? Yeah, how do you balance it? Um, you have a really awesome <laughs> wife. I have an awesome wife and who takes care of the kids. And it's difficult because they're both really young and both want my attention. It's a lot of times my dad, my, my dad, my son goes, dad, don't go to work. You can't Aww, go yeah. like play with me. Yeah. And my, my daughter just is like the cutest thing. And, and um, they are pretty damn cute. I'm yeah. Say yeah. That. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so it's, it's really hard, but I try when I'm there um, to like give them a lot of attention mm-hmm. as much as I can. Mm-hmm. Um, and then with my wife, we try to, to, to set out at least like a couple times a month, a date night nice. or something like that. Yeah. Um, and, but sometimes that's hard cause she has her own schedule. Like she's like, uh, I work full time and, and she stays at home with the kids. Sometimes she babysits other kids, uh, which makes it doubly stressful for her. Um, but like whenever I can, um, I, I make sure that I um, 
put down my son so we can have the you know so we do his whole routine um try to take him when i can places uh my daughter's a little bit harder you she's know she's younger yeah she's only a year and a half um and and just really be there for them uh as well as try to keep my own sanity i really try a balance of of taking t- my wife doesn't like this but uh, taking time out for myself just on my own mm-hmm. um like you gotta have that go, as an artist. go to the movies go um do something that i'll oh, play basketball do a lot of that i know, I know you're you're yeah the three you didn't shot, go right? see, yeah three you didn't go see zombie land without her did you yeah oh <laughs> I listen, listen, listen. I have the movie pass, the AMC movie pass. Oh, right. I gave her the option. She doesn't care that much. Like for her, a movie like the big ones, the big Marvel movies, she'll she'll like that's kind of the thing that I have to make sure that I wait for her. Right. right. Everything else, uh, like it's gotten to the point where like I just don't mention it. Cause if I mention it, she's like, Why didn't you take me? But if I don't mention it and she says, Did you watch it? Then she's like, Okay. Uh <laughs> but because she just wants to be included, right? Of course. Yeah. And, and it's a hard thing because, you know, she's with the kids all day. And then when I come home and I'm at work all day, and then when I say work, it's like going to this, to this, to this, to this, to this, right? I still have to teach and a if class. That happens to be a matinee in the middle of, yeah. of the day. So that's what I'll do. I'll go to a matinee maybe like once a week. And she knows it. She just doesn't ask anymore what movie. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, she just <laughs> assumes I've seen everything. Uh, but like, at the end of the day, you know, she'll, she'll be like, I'm, I'm done with the kids here. It, it's on you. Or sometimes she'll she'll go out with her friends or do so. Anytime that I'm at home and I don't have a gig, then I take over for the kid with the kids. And it's my pleasure to do it because right. they're a lot of fun and goofy and silly. And we sing Baby Shark all day. And, uh, <laughs> and, and I let her go and do her thing. So she likes to go. Um, her new thing is rock climbing. She'll sometimes go salsa dancing or just she'll have mom's nights out where they go and they get a hotel and they drink and they have fun and they do their thing i and, like her yeah I, we need to have her on the show next you know here's the thing <laughs> i got invited to um a, a few years and we'll, i'm sorry i'm getting away from no writing, this is great yeah uh to this thing called the gathering of joy mm-hmm. where they took us out they take us out to mexico and it's just a week long of people speaking about like professional speaking of different aspects of maintaining joy and one year I went on my own because uh, they, they paid for me to go out there. The next year, uh, uh, they allowed Renee to come. And that was uh, like I gave like a performances. I gave a workshop and they loved it and, and everything. And but the thing that I heard the most is I can't. We love you, Gil, but your wife is <laughs> <She's> amazing. <awesome. laughs> and I'm like, you don't know the at home Renee. You know, <laughs> she's still amazing. She was but it's, it's just, it's just dip. She, she's more of a people person than I am. Interesting. She's a lot more of a people, like just small talk. Just right. getting to know you. Like she'll, she'll meet you for the first time. Oh, what's your Facebook? And da 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 da. Whereas me, uh, I speak all day for a living. So when I don't have to, then I don't as much. You know, I think that's true of creatives. Mm -hmm. You know, we spend a lot of time in our heads. Mm -hmm. You know, I always say that I'm a introvert pretending to be an extrovert. And, you know, because when I'm done, so I do a lot of speaking and I love it and Mm -hmm. I get fired up by it. And but when it's done, I am like dead. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know how you can go to another event and continue to give and give and give because it takes so much energy. It does. To do that unless you're a true extrovert. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that might just be a a question of momentum, right? Maybe Mm -hmm. it's like, well, I'm doing this. Hell, I'm going to keep doing it. You just keep going. Yeah. (laughs) And and what's hard is and this is something that like. I keep trying to convey to my wife is like what's really tiring is starting and stopping and, and shifting your brain Me too, into totally. to other things yeah. like, um, you know, going to one meeting and then going to another. And especially if I have to introduce yourself, sometimes I'll introduce myself and I'll, I'll begin to say though, I'm representing another company that I'm not <laughs> representing. And like I work right now, currently I'm working for two different theaters and right. you know, I say this is the wrong thing if I'm just giving my intro. So like, yeah, that's that's the hard part and just shifting your brain and then in your in your constant that's the thing like that's why i feel justified like even going to the movies because i'm constantly working like if i'm driving from one place to the other i'm working i'm working things totally. out in my head and oh, yeah. consider so like it's it's yeah there's definitely fatigue and then the uh, one thing that i learned about this year is a lot of the work i do is in places that are, are high trauma 
Mm-hmm. So I work in the prison. I work at San Diego Rescue Mission. I just mm-hmm. got done working with VVSD, which is a, um, a rehab center for for veterans, you know, um, and uh, and then in a lot of high schools. So uh, a lot of these a lot of these people they have trauma and we, we discuss it and they bring it out in their writing and you being someone who's empathetic and an empath, yeah. you take a lot of that on. You don't even realize it. Totally. You take a lot of that on. And so you have to find ways to decompress. Um, and, and I didn't know that that was happening. Like, uh, so, uh, I really, I, I'm focused on that now. Like, okay, how am I going to like let this go and, and, and uh, recharge to, to give my all again. Yeah. And I, I think that's a, it's a talent mm-hmm. to be able to recharge and to know when you need that, mm-hmm. that time to yourself. I call it staring out the window time. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's when you're doing your creating. Mm-hmm. You don't necessarily have to be in the act of creating to be creating, but you're always creating. I do most of my creating in the shower mm-hmm. or when I'm on a walk or mm-hmm. yeah. And without that time, I think we go crazy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. given too much you know one of the things that i like that i'd like to know a little bit more about is the saying you have that you, the way you used to sign off on your blogs be now mm. you seem to live your life like that you always yeah yeah um well it's i think that you know living in those other places the past or the future um that really leads to depression mm. um uh, if you're not careful have you ever battled with depression no you seem like you're a pretty happy positive yeah i i get i get down on myself but like i I know people who are very close to me that battle with depression and who have to take pills for it and everything like that so in seeing that i would say no Mm -hmm. like i'm pretty good at like staying pretty even keeled knowing that uh, in fact like i'm kind of weird like if a lot of bad things happen to me I get kind of excited because I know it's going to take an uptick. It's starting to yeah, yeah. uptick, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then... When the, you're at the bottom, the, you know which way is up. Yeah. That's right. But then, then the reverse is true. Like, I'm like, oh, Things are going too good. What's yeah, going to happen? things are going too good. <laughs> like I, but usually it's like not huge slopes one way or the other. So then I don't... And then in that case, and I look back at the evidence, uh, okay, uh, I look back at my life and everything, I've always been pretty okay and in, in if, if anything like it's been a slow uptick you know mm-hmm. what i'm saying in mm-hmm. the opportunities that i get and the, the and the things that I'm, I'm i'm able to accomplish so if things stay the way they are then and then i'm good you yeah, know it's just gonna keep getting better right the hard thing is is comparison Hmm. you know and uh, especially in this day and age and and stopping myself from comparing me to my other contemporaries or just anybody doing their thing um because again uh, doing something new excites me so like when i see people being able to do these new exciting things even if they're not in the world of art uh, like i want to do that too you know Mm because i just want to experience everything yeah uh before i go you know um but uh that's the only thing that really kind of hits my heart but i kind of shake it off because i got things to do (laughs) that's right yeah we just got to keep on going yeah keep on moving and and, forward momentum and and one of my other sayings that i use all the time is my path is different Mm -hmm. my path is different than than anybody else i can't i can't compare like i um, i was supposed to be at this place in this moment and 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 remember those moments you use inspirational words to build poems that Mm -hmm. you then use to entertain Mm -hmm. through a combination of spoken word and rhythms and beats. And I wonder how you came to understand that words have the power to heal. Was there a pivotal moment in your life when you realized that words have power and that you could do something with them? They could be used as, as a, as a sword. They could be used as, as something to build community. Um, when I was in high school, there was this uh, young lady who was kind of overweight and she was really dark skinned. And um, I it was in like a choir rehearsal as part of the school choir. And um, uh, I remember some of my friends were making fun of her and I joined in, mm. you know, and uh, she was like devastated. And then she ran at kind of outside and like they were still laughing and my heart broke. Oh yeah. And, and I, I ran out and I started talking to her and I apologized and everything. That's how I knew that that how much words can cut. So, you know, as I started performing and everything and people 
told me how much I meant to them, uh, the, my words and what uh, I, I, I did. That's how I knew that words can heal as well. Wow. But it took that first experience to, to realize the, the spectrum, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. So now it's kind of funny. Like uh, sometimes like I'll be messing with my friends and they'll make crack jokes at me or like I host a lot of shows and sometimes I host shows with comedians mm-hmm. and comedians like to take little shots at the host. I curb, I, I, I'm a pretty quick guy and like I'm very good at improv and, and off uh, uh, on my feet. I always curb my, uh, this just happened last Tuesday. Uh, somebody said something about my shirt, one of the comedians. And like, I, I was on the mic right after him and someone like someone in the wings, they're like, go get him, Gil, get him, get him. And, and I didn't uh, because I know how powerful words can be. And I know that it was gonna, just going to be an exchange and it's going to escalate. Mm-hmm. And I had to. And so when people do that, or even my wife, like I shut up. Uh, and, and I'm like, all right. And I just smile because like, I know how powerful words can be. And I'm scared of my own, my own power in that. Yeah. Cause I do it for a living. Wow. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and so I'm very cognizant of that. So if, if like jesting goes too far, then like I, I stop it real quick. That's awesome. Yeah. 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 Well, that's an incredible thing to know that you have that power and then yeah. to be able to wield it when you think it's best wielded. And that yeah. is to inspire people and, and yeah. entertain people. But mm-hmm. I think you do way more inspiration. The entertainment I think is a byproduct of the inspiration. Yeah. Mm, yeah I, um, again, I, I write things that I need to hear. I write things that, that um, um, I always say like, what am I trying to say with this? And so what's the, the core emotion that I'm trying to elicit? So I like, as I'm saying it, if I'm not feeling that core emotion, mm-hmm. um, then then I have to change what I'm writing. Yeah, Interesting. I, I change what I'm writing or how I'm saying it, right. you know, and even like the rhythm of how I'm saying it. You know, if I'm saying something like a lot of poets, like they'll just kind of especially spoken word artists, they'll they can be saying the like the deepest things, but they like plow right through it. And it's just really fast and rapid fire. Mm -hmm. And they don't give the space for the words to hit or to breathe or for them to even feel the emotion. It's just like one emotion throughout the whole thing and one energy. And and I, I think they they miss the chance to really connect with people or look someone in the eye or or really tell someone, you know, this is how I'm feeling or this is how I feel about that subject uh, by just trying to get through the performance. You yeah, know? yeah, that's so true. Mm-hmm. It's interesting because you know I'm I write memoir mm-hmm. among other things, and there's so much healing power in memoir. Mm-hmm. And when people first start writing, they do they plow through it. They don't actually let themselves mm-hmm. get into it and experience it because mm-hmm. um, it's scary. It is scary. It is scary. Yeah. And again, like I try to do the things that excite me, and which kind of is synonymous with things that scare me. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So the new projects that I'm doing, it, they they're they're gonna they're scaring me. <laughs> um, one I I want to do is particularly on that subject. Like, I want to interview people who in my life, like uh, archetypes that that have scared me in the past or have confused me or I don't understand that world. And, and um, one of the things that I have been, been blessed with being able to do, and I've done this for a lot of corporations and individuals is, is like sit down with a person and listen to their story, having not heard it before and then regurgitate it poetically and get the the feeling out of it yeah. going back to soundtrack of the unheard. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I do that for corporations. I've done it for individuals and it's like trying to get what they feel um, poetically out. And so uh, I want to do this for these people that that like I would cross the street to avoid when I was younger, mm. you know? Wow. And and so that's very scary because I got to deal with those emotions. Right. Totally, and I yeah. got to deal with how I because because not only am I going to tell their story and like once I'm done with this, um, you know, I, I'm going to share it with them before I present it to anybody and say, like, does this feel authentic right. to you? Yeah. You know, but now that the problem is like, how do I find a skinhead? 
You know what I'm saying? How do I how do I uh, uh, find someone uh, like a maybe like a, a white Republican cop that's very conservative? Right. You know, that, yeah. Uh, like and and get them to sit down and just have an honest conversation and, and try to tell their story. And uh, I want to call it something to the effect of the, a night of empathy, mm-hmm. like so we can hear these stories and, and compare and contrast and get the audience to really ask themselves like what type of, and be really honest with themselves. Like what type of people, you know, scared you in your youth? Like if I was walking along and I saw a group of black cats and I didn't know them and they were bumping their music and smoking and stuff like that, I wouldn't, I would cross the street. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And, and then that's my people. Mm -hmm. But like, and maybe the next day I could have been a part of that as well. But if I don't know you, then, then um, I'm crossing the street, but I have to deal with that as well. Cause that's, I'm seeing what, you know, someone who's not black is also seeing, you know, Mm -hmm. and sensing that danger. And so we have to be honest and kind of say it out loud and, and how do we deal with it and not be afraid to talk. Cause now I'm in, I'm in rooms uh, every week with prisoners mm-hmm. and like I don't know what like these guys do but I know this is maximum security I know on on the yard I'm in this is like one like the third tier meaning like a yard is people who have done a uh who have um a lot less points you know okay when you get points then it's like uh so violent crimes is more points yeah or or you're not uh while you're um there if you do things like if you get caught with contraband or you get in fights, you get more points added to your your um, your record, which equates to more time. Mm-hmm. The more programs you do, the the more model of behavior that you have, the less point you get points taken off. OK. And then you it can eventually reduce some of your time. Oh. So, you know, I'm on like yard C, uh, uh, which is is uh, it golden goes from A to D. So if you can imagine and mm-hmm. be something different, but anyway, I don't get too much in that. But my point is like, I'm in the room with people that I would cross the street to avoid. Right. And these are the nicest dudes that I've ever met. The most respectful dudes. And I get along with them so well. The, the, the hard part is, is that we can't really be friends because we have to have that kind of boundary as well. Oh, of course. You know, so. Yeah, you know, I've always thought that, you know, you get two people, and just the skinhead, mm-hmm. you know, is a good example. Mm-hmm. But you put yourself in a room with another human and, and we change. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And I think it, it has a lot to do with tribalism. You know, your tribe's not there anymore. It's yeah. just you and another human being. Mm-hmm. And there's an honesty not always. I mean, I think there's just some bad people, mm-hmm. you know, and they just, they, they have bad thoughts and they, I don't, but I think for the most part, when you get two people in a room and you just let them talk, like mm-hmm. we all have common ground, Yeah, we know our humanness comes out. And mm-hmm. I think, I think that's a beautiful thing. Um, yeah. People are less willing to let that side of them show mm-hmm. when they're face to face with you. Yeah. You know, and uh, I can, I can imagine that this would be an incredibly powerful YouTube show. Yeah, where you actually film it and you capture that emotion. Mm. I'm. I think that's awesome. I want to do it, but I do want to do it live because there's this like certain energy when you totally. do things you gotta live. Totally, you got to do it live. And then it, what it, what it comes out to after that is yeah, but you you could be inciting a riot. <laughs> Do if you do it live. I love that it's so things that you're personally afraid of. Yeah, you know, as opposed to like finding two people that may not otherwise get along. Yeah, <clears throat> take the liberal and the conservative and put yeah. them in the same room and see what happens. But yeah, you're actually tackling your own fears, and yeah. that's that's even more powerful. Yeah, yeah, and so and because I have to because I wanted to come up and do a solo show for the longest time, and I was coming up with all these different concepts. But like, I, again, I never want to make it just about me, mm-hmm. you know, like even but if you're I'm, willing to make yourself vulnerable exactly. and that's the thing. it's not about you. It's about the vulnerability and that's yeah. the authentic piece. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Wow. So we'll Gil, see. that's really cool. We'll see what yeah, happens. And you insist on doing it all in live performance. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's yeah, awesome. Yeah, I would totally, yeah, yeah. totally support that. Man. The, yeah, I, there's, 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 what does your wife think of this? Um, she's, she's with it. She's with it. Um, like she's scared for me. Like when I go into prison, mm-hmm. you know, because like I, I have to wear like this, like, cause there's no guards where we're at. 
What? Yeah, we're in a room in, in the chapel, no guards. Their guards are like between two huge steel doors and then outside, and they may be around or they may not be. I have a panic button oh, in my, that I keep no in my pocket, way. which if I wear pants tight enough, then it oh, accidentally right. goes off and you see all these guards come in. But And that's <laughs> happened once. <laughs> that's a piece in and of itself yeah. right there. Uh, but but um, yeah, there's no guards and, and you just kind of just trust and so she gets scared uh a little bit nervous on that and and everything and but they're there because they really want to learn yeah and he'll and they want to earn those points yeah they're there but they can earn points other way they they really want to be there because we we play theater games and we we discuss themes and 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 what it is is like they're allowed it, it it's a different behavior than when they are on the yard. Mm-hmm. When they're in the yard, it's like it's the same thing as you're saying. Like they they have to be in their cliques. And they, they can't like commingle like blacks and Mexicans and stuff yeah. like that. And it's mostly blacks and Mexicans. In fact, in my in all the classes that I've t- taught, it's all been black and Mexican. And then, but when they get into our room, no matter what race you are, like everybody walks around the circle because we put the chairs in the circle and they say, "Hey, how you doing? What's up?" and everything like that, and they mm. give respect to everyone in the room. Nice. And that's something that I don't see in any other place outside of of the prison. So imagine when you come into a room, like maybe if it's like a small meeting, mm-hmm. but otherwise a general room, you don't walk around and say hi to every single person. You walk and you say hi to maybe one or two people, and then that's it. And then you're in that conversation until whatever starts that's going to start. They make sure that they say they give respect to each and every person but is is that under like potential threat of violence that they're no uh, is that changing their behavior no. because they don't want that particular tribe to be you mean no. out in the yard no no, no no in the classroom i mean in the classroom in the no in the classroom they just the respect is a huge thing so they just show each other a lot of respect and, wait they do this on their own yeah they do this on their own oh. this is not a rule that we make this is okay. not a rule that the prison prison yeah. makes interesting this is so in in prison um they have kind of like the prison rules but even bigger and more profound are kind of the 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 prisoners like inherent rules that they like that kind of go unsaid some do go said but a lot of it goes unsaid and like you know, that's one thing that I just noticed in every class. Like they just come and they shake everybody's hand and, and show respect to everybody that's in the room, wow. no matter what they are. And everybody's wearing their tattoos all over them. Sure. I mean, they're wearing it. They- they, and many of them have like real big face tattoos, head tattoos and everything. Mm-hmm. But in the class, none of that matters. But they say like out in the yard, if if someone that you're boys with, like say if, if I'm black and I'm friends with a Mexican in the class and we pile around, we, we have scenes together and everything. If something goes out in the yard and it's, it's black and Mexican, you better side with your side no matter what. Yeah. Otherwise you're going to get it, you know, later on. So yeah. it's, it's pretty, it's just really intense. Like you go in this in place and we're all kind of happy and together, but like someone will say like, I was like, Hey man, well, how's your week been going? Ah, oh, man, this is, exact almost verbatim conversation of this last friday hey man how's how's your week been going ah oh, uh, oh, it's been pretty crazy you know uh and i was like oh yeah anything interesting happened not not much but like a lot of ods going you know overdoses on the yard or you know another week uh someone just got stabbed or you know what i'm saying like but and that's but, their every day that's their every day but in the yard i mean i mean in the class you wouldn't even be able to tell mm-hmm. you know talk about some resilience right yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And having that creative outlet, I can I can only imagine like from from the perspective of trying to be healthy mm-hmm. inside, like that's just gotta be huge for them. Yeah. And then uh and so we uh but that's kind of what helps me stay at even kill because like I know what the possibilities of where my life could have been. Mm-hmm. Cause these men are a lot of them are my age. They look just like me. Mm-hmm. There's no difference except our outfit. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Cause yeah. they're nice and they're creative and they're very smart. Um, and how do they end up in these? Exactly. It's, yeah. it's just, you know, had I lived like, you know, 30 miles down the road or 10 miles or even five miles uh, down the road, it could have been a completely different guilt. Yeah. You know. Right. Yeah. Damn, that's deep. Yeah. I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, when did you join the military and uh what was the reason? Was it out of patriotism or was it out <laughs> of economic necessity or uh, more so economic. Um um my mom 
in, in I don't know. All right. So when I was getting out of high school, well, while, while I was in high school, really my mom's focus is that I, I stayed out of trouble and that like I graduated, you know, she wasn't the type of mom to like ask or even push about SAT scores and never took my SATs. Hmm. Um, didn't ask about college, anything. Cause that really wasn't her reality. She wasn't, it wasn't in her realm. Yeah. It wasn't in her realm. Like, she understood it, but she more so she understood hard work, mm-hmm. you know. And so as long as and, and my sister had gone to college, you know, before she's five years older, she went to, off to college and everything like that. But she took every, everything on her own. So it was her passion. Right. You know, um, so with my mom is just as long as I graduated and was good. But, you know, as I was getting uh, getting out of high school, she she was worried about, you know, like, what are you going to do next? And so um my dad was in the military and she pushed me into the military. Like, like was like saying, you know, it was my choice, but like, I think that you should do this because she just saw all the benefits, you know, get to travel, get get taken care of. And she is is immediately after I moved, I got out of high school, she moved to Virginia and she was, so I knew she was moving to Virginia across country. Hmm. And so it was either go live with her and go to community college and, and try to find my life there. And I had been in California pretty much all my life yeah. or join the Navy. And, and, but I, I was kind of stupid cause, um, um, my dad was a CB and that means that when he did construction, so wherever he went, he flew. And the guy who recruited me was a CB because we we lived next to a CB base. And I actually lived on the CB base for a while, um, which means that he it was the same thing for him. So I really didn't associate Navy with <laughs> ships. You didn't? <laughs> no. Oh. Like, I, I you kinda, were surprised to I see all that moved, water. <laughs> I kind of knew, but I just didn't like I just thought I'd be flying everywhere I went. So, so, um, when I, I got, when I got into the Navy, um, I, the first thing I was doing was on a ship. So I was getting, um, seasick for the first three years out of four, (laughs) three out of four years. And, and and I was being shipped off uh, in, I had a rare story. Whereas I was on three different ships in four years. Usually you're on one ship in four years. I was on three different ones. So that's because you kept throwing up on them. (laughs) Probably no. So I I definitely went out of necessity um, because I just wanted something else to do. So glad I did it. Um, And, you know, there's there's still things that I benefit from those small four years in relative uh, your time. I've gotten so many benefits out of it in the aftermath that like, um, you know, I wouldn't have traded it for the world. Right. But. If you don't mind, I'm a word person or a writer, uh, uh-huh. and, and I want to bring you back to your blog. Okay. Which you haven't written in, in a long time. No. Yeah, so part of me is like trying to coax you into <laughs> blogging again, because I know you have so much time. Yeah. 3 a.m. instead of 5 a.m. will be your new wake up. Yeah. So it's called Drive-Bys and Bathroom Hugs, mm. and it was your birthday. Okay. And you got to revive me, because I remember the title, but I, I don't remember what I wrote. So Renee picked you up from work. She made you think you were going to spend your birthday alone. So you were just, you know, you were at work, and then she, she picks you up, and y'all had to stop by a Target for whatever reason. Okay. And she comes out of the bathroom. You know, she just washed her hands, and she comes walking up, and you just grabbed her and gave her this huge hug, and you swung her around, mm-hmm. and you were just, like, filled with joy and happiness. Mm-hmm. And you put her down, and then there is this middle-aged white guy standing there. He's like, well, if you're giving him out, and he put his hands out, and uh-huh. you grabbed him and picked him up and swung him around. <laughs> I do remember that. And I thought that was pretty awesome. Yeah. It's an awesome visual, but it also says a lot about how you, who you are mm. in, you know, giving to people that's like, hey, this guy needed a hug. You don't yeah. know why, but it, I, I wonder if it affected you more than it affected him. Mm, maybe. And I we all know because we, we can't ask him, yeah. but, yeah. but it's, you know, when someone opens themselves up like, like that mm-hmm. and then you, and you accept that, like it's a, it's a pretty beautiful gift. Well, I always said that, like, I was the kind, always the type of artist that um, at the end of my sets, uh, women wouldn't throw their panties. They just want to give me a hug. Mm-hmm. You know, like, they wouldn't want to give me their phone 
phone numbers. They're just can, can I, just, I have a hug? Can I just hug you? Yeah, it happened so many. times. I hugged you. <laughs> yeah, did you? I totally did. I came up. I said, "Can I have a hug?" And yeah. you're like, "Absolutely." Yeah, and and it was funny. Uh, the f- funny thing for my TEDx talk, mm-hmm. um, I had mentioned that um, that uh, like I'm giving out hugs or something like that. So then, did everyone get in line? They got in line. Totally, yeah. of course they did. Yeah. That's awesome. So it was like a big hug fest, and you know. I'm a hugger, but like it's not. I'm not the type of hugger like, like I have to hug you like to feel normal. But if it just happens, it just happens. Like I, I don't need need it, but I don't know. Uh, I don't mind it either. You know? They say you're supposed to have nine hugs a day. <laughs> That's like for better health. Mm. Yeah, so you can start counting your hugs now. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> like, I, I probably have, including my kids, probably have like um, you know four or five a day nice because most of the people that i interact with like i, I hug them when <clears throat> i see them if i've met you if i've met you more than once or twice then then i'm, I'm hugging, gonna yeah. give us a hug yeah the awkward thing is with guys and you know like you don't know if you're going the clap first and then the hug uh, <laughs> a lot of a lot of guys they'll like swat your hand away have you seen that before i haven't experienced the hand swat no that's weird like that's happened to me that happens to me a lot actually so i'll go like this because i think i'm gonna clasp their hand and then hug their back right oh and then they slap it away like ah, i'm not gonna shake you yeah, hand. like we're past all that. Let me give you a hug. Oh. Gotcha. Um, and and it's not like a hard slap. They just like kind of move my hand out of the way. So then, like I feel like um, now they think I was just gonna shake his hand. Yeah, like right. like or or it makes me feel like they value our relationship more than, than like we're at the 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 full on hug level, and you're treating me like we're at the clasping and then hugging <laughs> level. When to me it's all the same. It's right. just whatever your preference is. Totally. You know. <laughs> Chaz, the Midwestern awkward hugger. Mm-hmm. So it takes him about 10, 12 years before he will hug you. Oh, really? He'll do it, but uh, it's awkward. Mm, see, but now I know. And, but and see, I, he's like the most loving guy. And I'm just going to talk about you now. Yeah, like I'm not here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Third person Chad. But he, he is very giving. It's just how he grew up. You know, Midwesterners mm. don't hug. And we have uh, uh, some friends. She's from the Midwest. He's from California. And he's like a total hugger. And she's the same way I hug her. And she's like, so mm. now they have this thing at the end of any whenever we get together and have dinner she's like okay we better have our awkward hug uh, bring it in yeah <laughs> it's pretty funny so for some more than others <laughs> you like hugs. for me it's just damn awkward it's mm. awkward hugging you know i'm gonna hug you after this right yeah uh, exactly. I, I know that's what we're <laughs> now that we've set it up uh-huh. it's, it's gotta happen <laughs> Prepare your body. <laughs> All right, I have I have one last question. Okay, what's been your rare unicorn? My rare unicorn. Uh, elaborate. Like, what do you mean? Like by the that? one thing that's made it all possible. If and maybe it's not a one thing, you know, maybe it's been a series, but you know, the thing that like a pivotal point where your career was really to, able to take off and you're able to pursue um, your dreams. Yeah, I could tell you that. I use that because you used those words rare unicorn in an interview once. Mm, okay. Uh, I don't know what I'd be saying. Uh, <laughs> You're like, I said that? He says a lot of things. Yeah. He talks for a living. <laughs> yeah. This is true. So there was a, um, I got to kind of take the story back. So my whole life, I always wanted to tattoo because I'm a creative person, like art. And I told myself I would never get a tattoo below my elbows because, you know, I'm older. Um, and so back in the day, it was like if you did it below your elbows, it was unprofessional. Mm. Now you see corporate guys with like totally. all these tattoos. Yeah. So I was working for a travel agency and I was doing art on at the on the side and like at night and everything. Uh, and uh, I they flew me to Tahiti. Mm. And cool. uh, I know hard work. And so. Uh, I got tattoos here and here below my elbow on my forearm for those of you guys listening um, it, because it was the moment that I had decided uh, that I was going to be an artist for the rest of my life and I knew it. It was right after my divorce um, before I met Renee and I knew that I was going to be an artist and so um, and then I was performing, uh, at, uh, this, at a Martin Luther King day festival, which I did for several years for a long time, um, in, in Ojai and, uh, around that time. And then there was that other connection that I had with the audience where I had them clapping and they, and I felt 
I felt what they felt and they felt what I felt and it was just like this exchange of energy and then when I got home uh, I just moved to San Diego or maybe I was still in Oxnard I don't know but my mom had sent me a a, a card and this all happened in the same like couple months uh, it was right around the time I turned 30 my mom sent me a card uh, randomly it wasn't my birthday it wasn't any special thing but she said uh, in the card it said congratulations on your new job and um, and that was it and I hadn't I hadn't changed jobs and so I called my mom um, she's like hmm. and I said why'd you send me this, this is weird she's like uh, what job are you talking about she's like the one God just gave to you and I had never talked to her about it and so that that was like my rare unicorn, like the trifecta of those things happening. And I never looked back. And, and that's when you got the residency at the Jacob Center? No, it was a couple of years uh, later after that. But I, I knew that I was going to f- really pursue. She was saying art. this is going to happen. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Uh, that's uh, awesome. Uh, uh, yeah. So your mama did give you this. She does. She's, she's, she's always supported me. She just, she always is very picky about how because i talk about her a lot in poems Mm -hmm. so she's very picky about how i i say things like i (laughs) i wrote a poem about uh uh this is when they were my parents were still divorced and i and i am still divorced did they get back together they got back together wow yeah they got they got back together (laughs) like um 15 years later or something like that after they got divorced in the same year that me and my wife got married um the uh i had imagined uh for some reason i imagined her like dating this this man and i said it in a poem Mm -hmm. you know and i and i just said he was six fingered i don't know why because i'm just silly like that and he played the blues and stuff and she always brings that up you said i was you told everybody i was dating some six fingered (laughs) man and da 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 uh but yeah so that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Well, Gil, thank you so much yeah, for coming out no and, and sharing with us and just being present and being in the now. I, I thank appreciate you for bringing you, us into your now. you pushing me towards writing a blog. I, I may I may just do that again. Cool. cool. So just make sure you're, you're everybody uh, sign up for my newsletter uh, yep. <laughs> that hasn't right. come in years and, and it's about <laughs> to come because there's a lot of projects that I'm doing. So yeah. I need to do that. Do you want to talk about any of them before we get off? Uh, and I yeah. just want to say gilsodu.com. That's G I L L S O T U.com. Perfect, perfect. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, do I want to talk about any? Uh, oh, well, this is not coming out for a while. That's okay. So we can, we have something to be excited so about. So I just had a play at the, the uh, La Jolla Playhouse uh, WOW Festival mm-hmm. that did really well. It was very well received. Um, I'm doing a play at the the airport um, coming up that I wrote and I'm going to be in uh, coming up this week. But we'll do another presentation in uh, Point Loma in November for everybody. Mm. Um, I have one that I wrote that I was commissioned. Uh, this is my second time being commissioned with the... Um, the old globe so i wrote a full-length play dealing with uh veterans and recovery and 12 steps and all of that Mm. um and it's part musical but mostly it's just a standard play so that's going to come out probably in early february uh, or january february and uh just keep encouraging me to write that solo show that I've been putting off for years <laughs> and encourage me to blog more and I will do it if the people ask. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank there you so much. No problem. All thank right. you. All right. All right. On to that awkward hug. Yep. Uh, yeah. Come I'm on. Sorry it got so hot. That was awesome. I really enjoyed spending time with Gil and getting to know him a little bit better. But to truly get the magic of Gil Sodu, you got to hear him perform. So we've got a special treat for you. We're going to play Gil's spoken word performance from the 2019 San Diego Writers Festival right after a few words from our sponsors. So don't go away. You're going to love this. Are you an author with a story to tell, but you're just not sure how to get that story out? Guess what? You don't have to do it alone. Marnie Friedman is an incredible writing coach. She offers personalized support and expertise to guide you from a kernel of an idea to completion. Visit MarniFriedman.com to learn more. That's M-A-R-N-I-F-R-E-E-D-M-A-N.com. This episode is brought to you by Monkey C Media, a small boutique design firm offering award-winning websites, 
book cover designs, book trailers, and photography services. And full disclosure, we love what we do. Chad and I founded Monkey See Media in 2004, and we're still going strong. Visit monkeycmedia.com. That's M-O-N-K-E-Y, the letter C, media.com to see how we can help you promote your book, build a powerful online presence. Mm-hmm. What else you got, Chad? Uh, let's see. We've got the San Diego Writer Festival. San Diego Writers Festival. There are many writers. (laughs) And they're a proud sponsor of our Premise podcast as well. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be awesome. This year's keynote is Scott Gimple. He's the head writer of The Walking Dead. And the festival is free. It's open to the public. There's going to be educational panels and workshops, famous authors, up and coming authors, kids and teen programming and live theater performances. Oh, and there's music. Oh, and there's food. Oh, but wait, there's more. You also get a copy of our home game. Oh, you're silly. But wait, there is more. There will be literary agents taking pitches from authors looking to get their books published. The festival is about building community and celebrating storytelling of all kinds. It's happening April 4th, 2020 at the Coronado Public Library. Speaking of the festival, here's Gil Soto from 2019. He rocked the house this year, and his word slinging ways are worth listening to. Let me tell you, he got two standing ovations. Let's listen. So, like Scott Gimple, like The Walking Dead? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. From The Walking Dead, I know. I believe in joy. I believe in joy like my mother believes that prayer is the strongest armor a person could put on, like my son believes that I am literally the strongest human being on this planet, I don't correct him, like my wife strongly believes there are always chores that can be done even on a Sunday. (laughs) I believe joy is inherent but easy to unlearn. I believe joy is inherent but unrecognizable in an Instagram lineup. I believe joy is inherently a part of us but gets diluted when we make choices that keep us isolated apart from us. I believe joy is analog and not digital. I believe it is all natural and not manufactured. And this is more of an opinion than a fact, but based off of what I've seen in the news lately, I kind of believe that joy doesn't visit Florida very much. I believe joy cannot be smoked, snorted, injected, ingested, or mounted. I believe that joy is mastering perspective, and it is the belief that everything, I'm talking everything, is for your benefit, especially the pain. I believe that joy is a horizon, and it is always beautiful and distant when you look outside of yourself for it, until the day you look down and recognize that you too are a part of that same sunset, and that there's someone out there looking at your silhouette in their horizon, both of you, uh, saying to yourselves, I want what they have, there is my joy. I believe collectively we all have this Gotham complex and are waiting for someone to come and save us, but that is not the place where joy lives. Ask my three-year-old son, he will tell you, I know Batman personally. And Batman told me that joy is in the rescuing. Do not be ashamed of that. The receiving of the gift is always amazing. You guys can give me gifts anytime you want, but the, but the real joy is in the giving of the gift. I mean, that is how we are built. That is why we call children God's gift. The ability to serve serves your spirit more than you can ever imagine. I mean, let's face it. Children are the most whiniest, clingiest, most destructive things on this planet. I have a one-year-old and a three-year-old, I know. And that's when they're, they're still cute before puberty. <laughs> But we love them because all we could do is give in to them, pour on to them. Ironically, by, p- placing, by placing the focus away from you, joy is placed within. I don't know how that works exactly. It may be magic, but I believe in magic. I believe in joy. I believe that I was meant to write this poem because I so desperately needed to hear it. Because I keep looking for joy in all the places I know it will not be. Curse you, Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles. <laughs> I believe I was meant to be here today in this library and that all of you are a part of my journey, so here we are. Silhouettes in our own pink and purple horizon. And maybe for some of you, your sky is bright yellowish blue and for others, you're right in the middle of your life's afternoon. And far in the distance, far in the distance are the people and the successes that you covet so desperately. And in between that, where you are right now and the people and the successes that you covet, in between that, 
is the reason why you were put on this earth. In between that are the people that you were meant to serve. Before you walk into your sunset, do not forget to look in the dust in the corners where the light cannot quite reach. Believe it or not, that is where your joy lives, right here in the communities that find you or the communities that you find. Isn't it so amazing that joy has never been out there. It's always been closer than you can ever imagine, just waiting for you.